You can tell I'm preaching today because I have a tie. I like to wear ties. I know Des calls them Protestant collars, you know. But, but hey, I never get to wear them, so uh, I like to. Uh, but anyways, we're going to be looking. Is this for me to time myself? Is that what this is up here for? It's going. <clears throat> um, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And what we're going to be looking at is how God loved us. I'm going to tell you something. I, um, last Saturday, Tammy and I, we went to a special meat shop. All right? And we got a, we got a what was it, a porterhouse? A ribeye, okay, we got a ribeye, and, and this ribeye was, you know, was that thick, and it was pretty big, and the thing cost $58. Yeah, I know, that's what I said too, are you kidding me? <clears throat> but, it was really good, right? And I want to tell you, Romans 5.8 is the ribeye of Scripture, Okay? <laughs> And I'll tell you, the whole time I was cooking it, I was nervous because I didn't want to overcook it and I didn't want to undercook it, right? I wanted to make it just right. I feel the same way about this verse. I hope that I can get this verse just right for you guys because it's such a cool and interesting and doctrine-filled verse that, that we, we need to be able to enjoy it. And I hope I don't overcook it for you, okay? Well, anyways, let's, uh, <coughs> let's read... Read Romans. We're going to start Romans uh, 4.23 because we're going to get the context of it. And, and in Romans chapter 4, uh, it talks about Abraham and how he was saved by uh, simply trusting what God said. All right? And, and Paul is going to make that, he's going to make that analogy with us too, that we are saved in the same way, that we are simply saved by trusting at what the Lord has said. And he starts in verse 23. We're, like I said, we're kind of breaking into the context. We want to get into uh, Romans chapter 5, 8. But he says, um, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. Okay, talking, to, talking about Abraham. He says, But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if... Okay, there's, an, there's a condition there. If... We believe on him that raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was raised for our offenses, or I'm, who, who was delivered for our offenses, I'm getting ahead of myself, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Okay, so he was, he, um, well, I'm not going to go into that. We're going to get a little further. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And verse 6, this is where I want to emphasize. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but God commendeth. That's a word that we don't use a lot, but it means that he sent his love, he demonstrated it. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That's a lot. 
there's a lot going on in there. And, how, and, and yeah, as Jeff says, hallelujah. Thank God for these verses that we can know and understand what God has done for us. You know, he has, uh, you know, simply talking about the, the love that God had for us and that he sent his son. But it raises to me, it raises the question, okay, well, what does it mean that he loved us? Because I don't, do, do we think of God as a, is he an emotional creature and he loved us like we love, you know, um, you know, love a, each other or love a, love a dog? I mean, and you find in the scriptures that God does have emotions, but the love that he's talking about here is a demonstration. It is something that he did, and that is the, that is the, the, um, the showing of the love that he had. And obviously, it's about Christ. And, and what he did for us at, at the cross. But I always had a question. I'm, when I was a young believer, I struggled with this. Okay, I struggled with how can God take my, my crime, my sin, and put it on Christ? Right? I mean, that doesn't make sense. If I do something, if I do something wrong, aren't I the one that's supposed to pay for it? Right? And, and in our natural world, that's the way it works. You know, if you do something wrong, you pay the penalty. But that's not what God shows us here in, in the Scriptures. But I had that question, how? How can that be? And why? Why would He do that? You know? So what we're going to look at today is how God does that. How does He take our sin and put it on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to look at an Old Testament verse, that, uh, an Old Testament chapter, that kind of that helped me to understand, that cleared up some things about how God could do this. Uh, and that chapter is, num is uh, Numbers chapter 30. If you will go to Numbers chapter 30, there's a, um, an Old Testament law. And it, it cleared some things up for me. <laughs> and it made some things understandable about what Christ has done for us. We're going to start in verse 1. <laughs> so when you guys are all there, we'll, uh, Numbers chapter 30, and we're going to start in verse 1. And <laughs> this is God giving Moses some instruction to give to the nation of Israel, right? Well, and, and it's going to say that here, so I don't even have to say it. But in verse 1 it says, And Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord and swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. Okay? We're going to go a couple verses and we're going to look at some other things. He says, If a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord and bind herself by a bond being in her father's house in her youth. Okay, this is a younger, a younger woman. She's still under the charge of her father. Uh, and her father hear her vow with her bond, wherewith she hath bound her soul. And her father shall hold his peace at her. Then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. So, I'm just kind of keeping it clear, all right? It says that if a guy is going to make a, a vow, we're going to look at a vow here in a minute, every, everything that he says has to stand. All right, and then if if a younger girl says a vow and she's in her father's household and her father hears it and he said, doesn't say anything, her vows can stand. But uh, but verse five. But if her father disallow her in the day that he heareth, not any of her vows or her bonds wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand, and the Lord shall forgive her because her father disallowed her. Okay, so I want to look at something here. Uh, if, 
if she makes a vow and her father hears it and doesn't say anything, it stands, right? But if her father hears it and doesn't, um, doesn't agree with it, then her father can disallow it and it doesn't stand, okay? So she's under the, she's under the authority or the headship, we'll call it, of her father. And, and that's not so hard. Uh, even this Old Testament law uh, it, it can still carry, you, you think about today, that even a youth cannot enter into a contract without the permission of their father. I think the age today is 18. And uh, we've had some experience with that. You know, there have been some times when I, I had a daughter and she said, uh, she made a deal with a phone company and uh, they started charging me for something that I never agreed to. And when they called me, um, they said, hey, she, well, Julie, uh, I, oh, I gave her name up. <laughs> <laughs> Julie made this deal with us. And I said, yeah, but Julie's like uh, 16. And they said, oh, okay, we'll get that right off your bill, right? So, so uh, 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 a youth is still under the headship of her father, right? But we want to look at something, and we're going to continue in this verse, so stay in number chapter 30. But we want to look, what is he talking about a vow? Okay, let's clarify what a vow is. Because I was confused about that. Okay, what is, what is a vow? We're going to look at, and a vow is just, is simply, it's a, it's a promise, or it's a commitment. But we're going to find out something about the Old Testament vows, okay? Uh, like I said, keep something in, uh, in Numbers 30 because we're going to come back and finish this chapter. Uh, but a vow uh, in Genesis chapter 28, and we'll, we're going to be real close so you'll see it. We'll see that Jacob makes a vow in Genesis chapter 28. <laughs> Genesis chapter 28. And in verse 20. Um, Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20 says, And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way, that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again into my father's house in peace then shall the Lord be my God and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house and all that thou shalt give me I will surely give a tenth unto thee so here's a vow and this vow is uh, Jacob's vow and he says that if the Lord will do this, right, what, you know, go out and, and, uh, and, and he finds his, uh, gives him bread, it basically supports him, and he makes it back to his house, then Jacob will promise this, Lord, I give you a tenth of everything that I make, right? That's, the, that's what they call the tithe, right? They call it the tenth. It's the tenth. So, so uh, you know, he, he had to fulfill that. There was no getting around it. Once he made that promise, he was a, that was a promise or a commitment made to God. It was a vow. So he, gave, he did that. He, uh, he promised the tenth. Now we're going to look at another vow. Okay, this is a vow of a woman. And you guys know who Hannah is in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Let's go look at her vow. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, this is a pretty intense vow too. First uh, Samuel chapter one and verse nine. Uh, and then it said, uh, "We'll go back to verse eight, and it says, and then said Elkanah." her husband to her Hannah, why weepest thou, why eatest thou not, and why is thy heart grieved? Am I, uh, am I not better to thee than ten sons? I kind of did get back for, further than I wanted to. But verse 9 says, So Hannah rose up after that they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon the post of the temple of the Lord. So Echaniah, Ek, uh, da, 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 da. Elkanah is her husband. Uh, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Okay? 
Uh, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look upon my affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there no razor shall come upon his head. So, she, so Hannah makes a vow, and this vow is a promise to the Lord. Okay? And what she says is, Lord, and, and Hannah was barren. She couldn't have any children, and that, she was upset about that. And she was, you know, basically they went to go worship in Jerusalem and she was crying and just having a, having a problem because actually her husband had another wife and she, was, she had other children. She was producing children. So she was sad about this. So what happens was she says, Lord, if thou will give me a man, I will, I will give him over to the Lord. And, and we find that she does that. She, she ends up having Samuel, who ends up being one of the, one of the prophets, and uh, in, verse, um, in verse 26, she, she, see, she fulfills it. And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, uh, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. And for this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord as long as he liveth, and he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshipped and, and the Lord there. So, so basically... Hannah, and, and you read the story, basically she, she has this child and she only gets it to the point where uh, I think that she weans him, you know, so he doesn't need milk anymore and takes him to the, takes him to the temple and gives him to the priest and there he spends the rest of his life. So basically what happens was Hannah, she, she made a vow and she went through with it. She filled it, right? Uh, so vows were very, in the Old Testament, and even today are important, but vows in the Old Testament were serious. You had, if you said something to the Lord, you kept it. And so, so uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, go to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, really cool verse about vows. And I think it can be said even for today. Even for today, I think this this uh, uh, bit of advice should stand in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Um, <coughs> and I'm going to back up to verse 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 2. <clears throat> be not rash with thy mouth. Or, you know, don't, don't be hasty. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon the earth. Thou, or, uh, therefore, let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. But verse 4, when thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than thou shouldest vow and not pay. I think that's cool, you know. But how, you know, so what would we do? How would you say that in a thing like today? Lord, please get me out of this so that I, I promise, Lord, if you get me out of this, I will go to church every Sunday, right? So that's the kind of vow that people would say today. Right, but God, God holds you serious. He holds the holds you serious to you. But you say you're going to do something. He wants you to fill. If he wants you to fulfill it, and if you're not going to fill it, don't say it. You right? You don't have to say it. <laughs> so, I just thought that was a that was a good verse to share with you guys. Uh, but let's go back to Numbers chapter thirty. So we know a little bit about what a vow is now. Right? So we understand what they're talking about in Numbers. It's a promise to the Lord. And, and we're going to find out something about these, um, about these vows here. Numbers 30. <clears throat> we left off about a youth daughter not you know, being under the headship of her father. And we're going we're gonna to continue in verse 6 now. 
<clears throat> verse 6, And if she had at, at all a husband when she vowed, or uttered all out, uttered out, I'm sorry, uttered aught out of her lips wherewith she bound her soul, and her husband heard it, and held his peace at her in the day that he heard it, then all her vows shall stand, and her vow and her bonds wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. Okay, so if she has a husband and he hears her vows, just like the, the youth daughter, if he hears her vows and he doesn't say anything, her vows stand. Okay? This is, gonna, this is gonna come back to our relationship with Christ. So it's an Old Testament law and it's good. Well, let's continue on. But if her husband disallow her on the day that he heard it, then he shall make her, uh, then he shall make her vow which she vowed and that which she uttered with her lips wherewith she bound her soul of none effect and the Lord shall forgive her. Well, what's he talking about here? So the husband can disallow this vow, right? But every vow of a widow and of her that is divorced wherewith they have bound their souls shall stand against her. So it's pretty easy. If somebody's divorced or somebody has, uh, is a widow, she says something, makes a vow to the Lord, it stands. She's, she's got to hold to it. But if she vows in her husband's house or bound her soul by a bond with an oath, and her husband heard it and held his peace at her and, disalloweth her, uh, and disallowed her not, then all her vows shall stand and every bond wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. But if her husband hath utterly made them void on the day he heard them, then whatsoever proceedeth out of her lips concerning her vows or concerning the bond of her soul shall not stand. Her husband, her husband hath made them void, and the Lord shall forgive her. So we're, we're going to look at, and it gets a little confusing, but what happens is you see that, is it sound, is that pretty clear? Well, good, then I don't have to explain it then. It makes sense. But basically, uh, you know, a husband, uh, we're going to get into a little more detail here, but uh, the husband can, dis he can, he can uh, allow or disallow the vow that a wife uh, uh, gave. Okay, now here's verse 13. Every vow and every binding oath that afflict the soul, her husband may establish it or her husband may make it void. But if her husband altogether hold his peace, at the day, uh, if, but if the husband altogether hold his peace at her from the day to day, and then he establish all her vows of her bonds which are upon her, he confirmeth them because he held his peace in the day uh, that he heard them. And verse 15 is really kind of the whole key here I want to get to. But if he shall in any ways make them void after he heard them, he hath heard them, then he shall bear her iniquity. Interesting. Here's a situation in which a husband, he hears his wife make a vow, and he, he, at this time, uh, he lets it go. He, he says, he doesn't say anything, so the vows stand, right? But at a later date, he hears them, and he says, you know what, I'm going to disallow those vows. Well, you know what happens to him then? He gets to pay the penalty for hers, for her vows. That's what the verse says. Uh, he says, uh, uh, then he shall bear her iniquity. So, there's an interesting concept here. We have a, a situation which a man, uh, when a, uh, that the man gets to take, gets to, he has to, he gets to take the penalty for his wife's, uh, um, you know, I, I don't know what the iniquity is here. I think about that. You know, we're talking about, uh, you know, I guess a wife made a vow that she couldn't perform or fulfill. So then since, since he didn't disallow it, he gets to take the blame, right? And there's a reason why, uh, why this happens. When a man and a woman become a husband, and a wife, uh, the Bible says they become one flesh. Okay? And so, so you got an individual and an individual, a man and a wife. And when they make a vow, 
Okay, a, a vow of a wedding vow is what we call them to, you know, that's what they are today. A promise before God that they, they, uh, they will keep each other for themselves, you know, for each other, keep themselves for each other. Then God says that those two people become one flesh. And when they become that one flesh, then the man becomes the one that is responsible. He's the one that becomes, he is the, um, yeah, it, it, the head, but he's, he's just the guy that, that goes to when there's a problem. Um, there's a, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I run a business. And I, there's like, I have, what, eight employees or something like that. We have about eight employees. And when something happens, they don't go to one of my eight employees. They come to me because I'm the guy that's in charge. Same thing in a marriage. If, if there's something going on, the guy is supposed to take charge. He's supposed to be the responsible one. That doesn't always happen today. It doesn't work. I mean, it works, in, you know, it works if we follow the way the Scriptures design it for. You know, it doesn't work when we put sin in the picture, right? Anyways, let's go to that. We're going to look at some verses that talk about uh, the one fleshness, okay? Because this is important. Because it has to deal with our relationship with Christ and how He can take our iniquity. All right? So let's look at Genesis uh, chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 and uh, verse 21. This is the first marriage here. I'll explain that in a minute. Genesis chapter 22, uh, chapter 2, verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in, instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God hath taken from man, he made a woman. And this is the part that I always like. And he brought her unto the man. Okay, so you got the Father, God the Father, and he brings Eve to Adam. And I think that's a picture of a marriage, right? That's what a father does when, he, when he's giving his daughter over to another guy. He delivers his daughter to the new, the new guy. Okay, uh, And then he says, And Adam said... This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall be one flesh. Okay, so, so when, when a man and a woman, Adam and Eve here, they became one flesh at this time. Now we're going to go to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5. And we are done in Numbers, so you can, you can drop Numbers and go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28. And it talks again about, we're talking about the one flesh. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. And then, and then he adds in verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So what's he talking about here? When, when a man and a woman, when they become husband and wife, like I said before, and as the scripture says, as the scripture is pointing out here, they become one. In other words, the, um, it has to deal with identity. Okay? 
Um, and I, th I think about that. My, we have a son that's going to be getting married in November. And what's going to happen there is his bride-to-be, she's going to take his name, right? So, her, and so she's going to go from being, I can't, I'm not going to use the names, obviously, but she's going to be going, going from where, where, you know, her last name, and she's going to take on our son's last name, right? And, and so she will then be identified with him. Now, it works both ways, too, because it says a, a man shall leave his, his father and his mother and, be, and cleave to his wife. So it's like this. Those two come together and become identified with each other. And that's what Paul is saying here when he says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So when we, well, when we choose to trust in what God has done for us, He makes us one flesh with Christ. And he, we become identified with Christ. Does that make sense? And He then, like as in a marriage relationship, how we, the man, takes the headship, Christ takes the headship of us. And it makes it to where He can pay the penalty for our sin. Right? Amen. We're going to look at a couple of things though. I heard, okay, that it was an old common rule, uh, old common law that a husband, uh, I, I've heard this, um, that, that a husband, <clears throat> Let me back up again. I, I had heard that it was an old common law rule that a husband could take a wife's penalty for a crime. Um, but I have to tell you, we, Tammy and I, we did a lot of research on it. We couldn't find one issue of that. We couldn't find, the, we couldn't find a rule. And we couldn't find a, an instance in which a man took the penalty for his wife, Right? And why would that be? Because it's against human nature, right? It's against human nature for us to take somebody else's penalty. But legally, um, that can happen. We're, we're going to, however, and it's funny, you could find all kinds of situations in which you could make somebody else take the blame for your crime, right? But I got an interesting thing here for you. This uh, sit, a situation, a little bit of legal speak, okay? But it's a, it's got an interesting conclusion here at the end, okay? This is Fury versus Fury, and it's in 1952, and it's in Virginia, okay? And what had happened is this man and this woman were in a car, and he was driving, and they got in an accident, and she got injured. So, she wanted to sue him, you know. Uh, but, between the time that they got in the accident and the time the, 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 time the court happened, they got married. Duh. <laughs> I mean, that sounds kind of weird, right? So, that, does that make sense? You understand the, the, the situation and how it's set up? She wanted to sue him because... She got injured, all right? I'm going to read you a little legal, little, little legal mumble-jumble here that, that's actually kind of, uh, kind of interesting. It says, The marital unity which settled rules of law have been recognized through so many years uh, pre prevents the operation of those general statutes designed to remove particular disabilities of a married woman, but this is the, this is the one. The question is not whether disabilities have been removed, but whether the long prevailing rule of law declaring a husband and a wife to be one person in legal contemplation have been annulled. So legally, she couldn't sue her husband because the law viewed them as one flesh. It's kind of an interesting uh, situation. It says, until this rule is annulled by statutes, all rights of the Action for the end, and nuptial wrongs of the husband to the wife are extinguished by uh, by their marriage. It's 
So, kind of interesting that, yes, uh, even in old, I, I'm sure these laws have changed by now, you know, with things, you know, laws change, but old English or old uh, American laws do and did declare that a husband and a wife were considered one flesh, you know, in the eyes of the, they couldn't sue each other, right? A lot of times, uh, uh, there, there, were, there was the law of, what, what, what was that? Uh, the law of coverture. So if a, if a woman did something wrong and she was married, uh, a lot of times she couldn't take the penalty because she was under the headship or coverture of her husband, right? So, see, it sounds foreign to us now. But you've got to think about it in the context of our relationship with Christ, okay? Uh, and we're going to come back to that. We're going to talk about the love of Christ, and, and we're going to wrap up here pretty quickly. I see I'm running out of time. 35 minutes. We'll wrap this up. God, how does this have to do with God's demonstration of love? And I have asked uh, Madison and Chris if I can use them as an example. I'm going to use them as an example. You don't have to come up here. I just want to... I want, to, I, I want to give the concept, okay? Let's say, let's say that Chris and Madison, you know, uh, they're married, and he's working, and let's say they, they need a little extra money. Well, Madison, she, went and get, she goes and gets a job at um, Dollar Tree, okay? So... Madison goes and gets a job at Dollar Tree. Chris is working. And this is where it gets kind of weird. But So when somebody comes through and pays cash, what do they, Madison takes and pockets the money. Okay, she's committing a crime. And, and Chris knows about it, right? Because you see an extra money come in the, uh, coming in the household. He knows she's doing something. He knows she's doing something wrong. But he doesn't say anything about it, okay? He's enjoying those $58 steaks every now and then, right? <laughs> but inevitably, what happens? You get caught, right? So Madison gets caught. She's caught, and, she's, and she goes before the court for stealing. She's stealing from her employer, Legally, when the punishment is handed down, if this is true, that the husband is considered one flesh with a wife, he could take her penalty. So instead of Madison going to jail for theft, in an act of love, Chris could say, I'll go for her. Right? That's something like what Christ has done for us. We've committed a crime. Uh, we are guilty. We're guilty of sin. We're guilty of the just punishment that God has for sinners. But Christ comes in and takes our place. And He takes our sin because of, because he can't, because of the, the, the headship. Because of that situation that he can take our penalty in that in in our relationship right um i think that you know it's not a, it's not an equal you, you, it's just an example what if and, and it, it's a little more to this point what if madison couldn't stand chris right what if what if <laughs> what if madison was chris's enemy right but, oh, and, and, you know, we need to go, I'm sorry, let's go back to Romans chapter, let's go back to Romans chapter 8. Okay, because I, I, I missed a point here. Darn it. Or, not Romans 8, it's Romans 5. Romans 5, 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 6, if you're there. 
For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Okay, so in the example of Chris and Madison, if he agrees to take, he agrees to take her penalty and her punishment because he loves her and she loves him, right? Peradventure for a good, uh, uh, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man. You might take the penalty for someone that is good or somebody that you love, right? But would you take the penalty for, some, for someone that doesn't love you? That's what Christ did. Yeah. And that he makes that comparison. He says, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah. It takes it to the next level. It takes it, I mean, we can't even, as humans, we can't conceive the level, right? That God would take our penalty and take our sin. But that's declared, that's what the scriptures declare. Um, he says, for when we were yet enemies, we were reconciled to God. There's a time when we were enemies to God. He still died for us and paid for us. When God the Father looked on Christ and what he accomplished at the cross, his justice was satisfied. Uh, we only got one more verse and then we'll call it a quit. Romans, or, uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. And what that means is that when God, God's justice was satisfied when Christ paid the penalty for sin. And when, when God the Father looks at us now, he doesn't see Jay and Michelle. He doesn't see uh, uh, Chris. Get my Chris's mixed up. <laughs> doesn't see Chris. He sees you. He sees the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did. Does that make sense? Just like a man and a wife. Uh, and, the, and you know, when, when we see a man and a wife, we see them as one flesh, right? God sees us through the lens of Jesus Christ. And that's how we can be justified before Him. Amen. Right? Amen. All right. That's it. I'm done. <laughs>